Hi, my name is Manley McLaughlin and I'm president of the BC Construction Association. We represent about 2,000 construction employers across the province of British Columbia. And I'm here today to talk about a really big issue for us and that's all about the availability of skilled workers in the industry today and into the future. But before we get started, I want to play a video for you. Let's have a look at it. Now, a reality check. There are plenty of new jobs available, but no workers to fill them. We've been hearing about it for more than a decade. There aren't enough skilled workers. Severe shortage of BC tradespeople. Tonight, jobs, jobs, and more jobs. Too bad BC construction companies have to go all the way to Ireland to find qualified employees. BC construction officials are headed to Ireland, armed with job offers. By the time Starkey gets his ticket, he may be competing with workers from Ireland. The last time BC went to Ireland, and the response was impressive. Would-be foreign workers lined up by the hundreds may expect the same later this month. The hoops that the employers have to jump through in order to actually go overseas it's not their preferred method. They'd rather deal with, with Canadians. The Irish people have welcomed them, uh, the opportunity to come and work in Canada with open arms. Is it popular to choose a, a trade as a career right out of high school when you're young? Definitely so. A lot of people went straight from um, straight from school to apprentices, uh, apprenticeships at 16, 17 years old. BC government numbers suggest there will be one million job openings in the next decade. The training programs haven't been keeping up. Only one in 32 students graduate from high school pursues a career in trades when they need one in five to fill the gap. Now those media clips were taken from national television news programs just a few weeks ago. Our trip sparked an onslaught of media coverage, phone calls, and letters. Many parents and students were up in arms saying that we're giving away good jobs to the Irish when Canadians at home don't have good jobs. Well you know what? This is not about Ireland. This is the need to change the conversation. This is about a skills and post-secondary education system in Canada that's struggling to serve the needs of our citizens and of our sector. The recruitment trip to Ireland is only a symptom. Let's see what's driving it. Let's start with some current BC statistics. By all accounts, this is a conservative estimate. It doesn't include proposed LNG plants, which will drive even more construction. The majority of our construction employees are 45 years of age or older. Only a tiny fraction of BC's high school grads are directly entering the trades. This is the change we need to see in BC, starting with the graduating class of 2014 to erase our skills shortage. To have such an unemployment rate when there are so many good paying, rewarding jobs is a problem. But it's a problem that's not unique to BC. Consider the Canadian numbers. The Canadian Council of Business Executives estimates this is the number of Canadian job seekers that will be unemployed in two years. Add to that the expected number of unemployed post-secondary graduates. Now that's a lot of people who could be doing something more productive, which is a shame, considering that we'll be short 1.5 million skilled workers. And across Canada, just like in BC, too many young people can't find work. Those are the numbers. Let's hear from some of the students who right now are sitting in Canadian university classrooms where they're not pursuing careers in trades. Because in my family it's always been that after high school you just continue your education and 
into university. Some kids or some of my friends, I guess, their parents really want them to go to university. They make it seem like you can get a better job with a degree instead. Hey, you got to go to university. It's going to be the best thing for you. If you don't get a university degree, you're basically going to be working at McDonald's for the rest of your life. Yeah, we're surprised on how many people just get random degrees that don't take them anywhere. There's not a, a, like a large discussion in high school about um, potentially going to a trade school or doing an apprenticeship. They don't bring up those kind of facts. They just specifically tell you which universities you'd most likely enjoy. No, I haven't considered a job in skilled trades. Neither have I. And I haven't either. It's just not something that really interests me. I personally haven't considered it. Um, I just don't know if I could do it. I'm inclined to, to follow something that's less physically arduous. I think it's because I'm a girl, so I never, when I was young, I never pictured myself being on a construction field with my hands dirty. I always just pictured it as a man job. I, I would do it if I couldn't find a job. Not good at math. Not very good with carpentry. If you don't want to take any risks, you get in the trades and you work there and you can have like a mortgage and a family and be very comfortable, even though the job itself is probably not as comfortable. Well, there's construction going on right over here at Ubic, and so uh, picture the orange vests working the bobcats, you know, moving around gravel. Just like trucking and, I don't know, uh, work sites, labor, that kind of stuff. Men in their welding pants, muscular man, um, someone who's like able-bodied. Trades people, they're maybe a little more impulsive. They, they like something, they want to get a certificate and start working right away and are like hands-on work and like to get, you know, physical every day. And Someone who didn't get a post-secondary education is probably between the ages of 20 and 30 and sort of had nowhere else to go. That would be the stereotype. If you're going into the trade, you kind of know what you want to do. It's a more specialized and you know direct program uh, compared to university programs. Yeah, I just figured a university degree would be better for better quality jobs. I sure hope I can work right away. I hope that when I graduate that I would have an easy way in getting to a job. It's a pretty scary experience to be graduating from um, like post-secondary education with $30,000 in, in student loans. I definitely don't want to get a degree that's not going to help me at all in the future, right? So No, I don't know no. what the um, um, employment rate is. I'm not sure. I imagine it's, you know, not that high, but, you know, pretty, pretty high up there, maybe, I don't know, 8%, something like that. I, I don't know. I know it's high, though, yeah. Probably pretty low. 20%. Pretty high. I would think that 14.5% for unemployment rate is low. 14.5, wow, that's a lot more than I thought it was. Wow. That's pretty big. I would expect that the unemployment rates would be higher than 14%. I would consider 14% high. I'd say that's relatively low. I'm not really sure. <laughs> this glimpse into the decision making process shows that there really isn't much of one. Expectations are low and yet extremely high. And how do you explain that students on the cusp of entering the workforce have little or no idea of the unemployment rate or where the jobs are and that they don't seem to be particularly motivated to find out? This is important for us to understand if we're going to be more effective in attracting students to the construction sector. But in a wider sense, it's also critical to creating a productive, successful, engaged workforce across the board. A common theme throughout our student interviews was their search for personal fulfillment, regardless of employment opportunities. You see in this graph how the number of times the phrases secure career and fulfilling career have appeared in print over the last 20 years. The trend is revealing. If you're thinking about where you'll get a job after graduation, you're risk averse. And how did that happen? And when did these two goals become mutually exclusive? Now, a Huffington Post blogger posted an opinion on this generation's approach to work and education, and he calls this the gypsy generation. Take a look at it. Look it up. It's interesting. It's been shared 250,000 times on Facebook and tweeted about 15,000 times. It's resonating. This is a key distinguisher of the gypsy generation that struck me because it was clearly reinforced in our student interviews. Baby boomers' kids have grown up being told they're special. They can do anything. 
For me, this helps to explain why the students we interviewed didn't know the unemployment rate for their cohort, or what their job will be, or even how they'll get a job to pay off their student loans, because they think it doesn't actually relate to them, just to everyone else. They're special. This is a cultural shift and critical to understanding what's going on, so that we can start to change it. Now this is how our student and future employees are feeling. Everyone will think I'm a loser if I don't go to university and my parents will kill me. I'm special. I'm not strong enough. Hence, Ireland. At BCCA, we're guided by a local to international prioritization. And it looks like this. The focus on hiring and training starts locally, driven by employer demand. We continue from there when the local areas can't supply the skills our employers need. And if all the jobs can't be filled, we go international. Collaboration is threaded through everything we do. I'm here today because increased collaboration with the education system is critical. In BC, our STEP program finds out from employers what hires they need to make. And then we skill up local people who have been on income assistance and unemployment insurance who are new to Canada or are in a minority group such as First Nations. This program works, but it's currently threatened by the federal government's new Canada job grant. I should mention that under our current programming, if you have a single university or college credit, you are immediately ineligible for the program. This is a requirement set by the government funders. We assess candidates and help them into the trades when it's a good fit. We'll place about 2,500 people this year alone. People like Krista. I'm an electrical apprentice. I'm a mom too. I'm a pretty strong personality. I would think I'm pretty energetic and rambunctious and, and like new challenges and I like to, to build things. I like to, to use my brain. I love my job. My employer is amazing and he's given me the chance to succeed and, and, and be something. I couldn't thank him more. And also to have these programs like STEP, I, to walk into my life and say, hey, we're going to give you this. We're going to get you where you need to be. To hear that school was going to be funded, it was like Christmas. I tell everybody about STEP. I think it's a phenomenal program. I really think that the challenge is getting over what what is not your norm. If you want to do something, if you're going to stand in the shadow and say, oh, I can't do that because, you know, well, I'm female, or get up and do it. You can't, you're never going to get anywhere in life if you don't get up and go. The, the, the saying's always, you know, great things come to people who wait. No, great things come to people who get off off their butts and work hard for it and the end result is extremely rewarding. I'm just beginning my journey. Krista's a smart woman, capable, determined. Ideally, Krista could have been steered into the trades earlier instead of a last resort after years of struggling to find her way. From my perspective, we're at a cultural crossroads. We're also in front of a major business opportunity for my sector and for yours. Success will take a concerted effort between public and private sectors, education and industry. We share the same goals. Let's be smart, responsible leaders and educate students about all their options. Success for them means success for us. Let's work together to create programs relevant to the labor market. This will generate revenue for our schools and businesses as well as our students. Successful graduates are the ultimate goal. Employed, self-reliant, building strong provinces and a strong Canada. We have a responsibility as leaders, educators, employers and parents to improve the way we do things. How will we realign education and expectations with real-life opportunities for employment? I've recently heard the phrase vocational liberalism applied to ideas such as the ones I'm about to share with you. For example, students report 
they sample different areas of study to figure out what they like. They often switch majors several times. Could trades be part of that first year mix? Trade students exposed to history and literature, Bachelor of Arts students sampling a trade, or for that fourth year student who's struggling to graduate, who's realizing they made the wrong choice for themselves, can the trades be positioned as a viable alternative? Consider mature students, continuing education, opportunities for a new curriculum targeting tradespeople in collaboration with construction employers, educating the intellect, creating a skilled intellectual workforce. Imagine graduates who are fulfilled and secure. In BC, Vancouver Island University is on the forefront of these ideas. Construction is big business. Employers are looking to support and retain the staff they have, as well as to attract new talent. They need to build their future leadership teams. That's a big opportunity for the post-secondary institutions. This is a new market. Culturally, socially, this is big stuff. If we don't succeed, then as Paul Capon says in the CBC documentary, The Jobless Generation, as a country, we're just managing decline. We are entering a global talent age, and from where I sit, where the construction and education sectors meet, Canada has some catching up to do. We don't need a new system. We need a tune-up, a more relevant, responsible version producing successful students. Universities promote critical thinking. They produce mathematicians, writers, thinkers. Construction needs these people, and they need us. In closing, I'll leave you with some thoughts from our students. Would it change your mind if I told you that the, there's a construction boom in BC and in Canada, and over the next eight years or so, the predictions are there's going to be a shortage of skilled workers of anywhere between 30,000 and 100,000 jobs just in BC alone? Wow, so you'd have an automatic job? <laughs> nice. <laughs> Knowing that there's going to be a lot of available jobs really does make me think, is this something I would want to go into? because I never considered it before. Definitely has in this past 10 minutes, yeah. You know, the fact that there's going to be such a big boom makes me want to consider it much more. I would consider it if you knew that you were guaranteed a job, basically. I haven't heard about the construction boom. I think there could be more information about, about jobs like that, for sure, yeah. I don't know what formula would come in. I would almost wonder why they wouldn't emphasize it more in high schools and stuff like that because universities definitely pushed more. Well, the people that don't come to, to you know, that go get a trades degree are more intelligent than someone who comes to go get a Spanish degree because they actually are going to have a chance of getting a decent job. <laughs> well, they're going to be making money and we're not, so good choice. There are construction associations in every province, and the Canadian Construction Association is based in Ottawa. Let's connect. I'm happy to make the introductions. Let's collaborate the way the business people, the architects, the engineers, the designers, the general and trade contractors collaborated when they put this great conference center together. I welcome your thoughts, your ideas, and your inspiration. Thank you.